Welcome to In Edina, a program about the people, places, and activities in the city of Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald, and this broadcast is being recorded from Fire Station Number 1 on Tracy Avenue here in Edina. However, by the time you see this show, this building may no longer be here, and that's because it's scheduled to be demolished. And joining us to talk all about the new fire station that's going to be coming uh, soon to this community is Chief Marty Shearer. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Lillian. And thanks a lot for letting us have this program in your final days oh, of having this building. Well, we really appreciate here. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, this is an old facility. It's been around a long time. And tell us a little bit about the history before we look forward to the future. Well, this facility was built about 1969. I think they officially opened it in 1970. Uh, it was built uh, for primarily just firefighting and mm -hmm. a little bit of fire prevention. And our, our operations have changed quite a bit since then. And um, now we're looking forward to moving to a new station. And you also have many more firefighters on duty we, now. We've, our staff has increased about twofold. We went from 16 firefighters to 32, 31 firefighters now. And we have also 14 volunteer firefighters. So you're looking forward to a brand new facility, uh, more than $4 million? About four and a half million dollars okay. for construction costs. To build it, and it has a lot of high-tech equipment in it now because your business has really changed. You know, it's changed dramatically. We uh, used to be just firefighters, and, and now we're also the paramedic and the ambulance service for the city of Edina. Uh, back in 1969, I think we had about 400 medical calls, or EMS calls as they're called. Over a full Over year. Over full year. And now we do close to 4,000, so almost a tenfold increase in, wow. in uh, medical calls. Wow. And fire calls have increased about 100% um, as well. So. Wow. So you've got uh, folks that are well-trained, they have new skills and new equipment, so you need uh, a bigger facility. Correct. Uh, the, the EMS uh, or the medical calls uh, are a different, different challenge than firefighting. Uh, all our people are paramedics, uh, except for our part-time people, and that, that's the bulk of our business. About 80% of our business is our medical calls, and we do have quite a bit of equipment. Uh, we need a lot of uh, different equipment than the station was built to accommodate. Uh, for example, an EMS clean room. We don't have an EMS clean room to wash our equipment. We have to use our old laundry sink right now. And now that's kind of important because right. a clean room, you go to a fire and you get debris, mm -hmm. but it, it has to be cared for in particular, uh, sanitized in a certain way because of the hazardous. Correct. And there's a lot of OSHA standards that need to be met as far okay. as the cleanliness and the, and the uh, sanitization of all the equipment. Uh, although we have a lot of disposable equipment, we still do need to clean a lot of equipment. We need an EMS supply room, which we didn't have. Our, our EMS supplies are scattered throughout our whole station And when right you're now. talking about EMS supplies, you're talking about medical supplies. Medical supplies. Things you, you carry. Know, what you kinds know, of things IV, are you carrying on the IV units? solutions, uh, all kinds of medications. We don't have a, a really good place for our medications. Some of the new medications also need to be refrigerated. We don't have some of that. Um, we, we have just a huge variety of, of equipment. And really, we're an emergency room on wheels nowadays. Mm -hmm and that we don't have the equipment or in the space to, to store and maintain a lot of that equipment. So you'd be right looking now. forward to getting a new facility and, and more, and you also store some medical records here too. We have lots of medical records and they're supposed to be stored securely once again and, and in, a, in, a, in a safe environment and, and currently they're just uh, stored in the mezzanine which is yeah. not, a, not an appropriate area. To, and your to staff has grown, talk about that. Yeah, the staff is, is, is much larger now and, it, and it's more diverse. We have women firefighters now which the station was never built to accommodate. There's just a, a men's locker room and a large dormitory style dorm to sleep in and our new facility will have both a men's and a women's locker room and we'll have separate bedrooms for people to sleep in instead of the large dormitory sure. style. Also office space is, oh, is sure. really really at a premium right now. Uh, five people share one office space designed wow. for one and uh, two people share an, uh, what was an old entryway that we converted into an office space. We cram two people in there now so uh, office space is also an issue for us. And your, your staff has doubled, too, as mm -hmm, well, correct. as you had mentioned, and, and they stay here in shifts, right? Our, um, most of our staff does. Uh, we have 24-hour uh, uh, firefighter paramedics that are here all the time. We have a, a staff of eight on shift each, each day, and that has grown from about five back in 1969, and uh, they sleep here 24 hours a day. We do have the administrative people, like myself. I'm here Monday through Friday, but uh, most of the staff is here 24 sure. hours. 
Well, of course, you had an opportunity to remodel this facility, yes. but it, it's better to build new. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, we looked at remodeling, and this building was never designed to be remodeled. It was very, very expensive. We did a, a needs analysis, and the, the, the remodeling uh, would meet our needs maybe in the short term, but not the long term. And it was very expensive, also very time consuming, and there's a lot of unknowns with the remodeling. So with a study session with the city council, the needs assessment, and some uh, pricing estimates, it turned out to be a, a better uh, economical deal and a speed deal to build the whole building new and sure. start from scratch. Okay. It's, uh, it's just quite a bit. We had, I believe, three different options even on the new building. We're going to remodel part of it, keep some, and add on. But uh, the best option was to demo the whole building well, and start over. thought that through, but what about all the staff? Where do they go when the building is being built? That's a good question. Uh, we are going to move most of our staff to our Station 2 on York Avenue. Okay. Also, some of the staff will go to our training center out by Braemar Golf Course. We also have uh, a trailer set up at our city shop, and our, our two our medics will respond from our city shop area, or city public works building, excuse me, which is over on Eden Avenue, and then also some of our staff will be over on Washington Avenue. So the shifts aren't going to change for them, just their locations where they report. Correct. Uh, you know, the community should not notice a difference in response time. Uh, we believe everything should work out really good. Uh, it'll be a little more difficult for us because we're spread out a little more and a little more crowded over at Station 2, which is sure. not designed for that many people, but it should work out well. Great. And you also provide other public service uh, services here out of this building, like blood pressure screening and things like that. Right. So that's not going to be happening. Correct. Not at this facility, but at Station 2 on York Avenue, you can still get your blood pressure checked. I believe it's 8 in the morning until 8 at night. So mm -hmm. come on in and Great. get it checked out. And you'll have plenty two. of staff there to take care of it Correct. in the meantime. Right. Great. Well, is there anything else you think we should talk about or as you look forward to this new facility? Well, I want to thank the community and the support we received from the community. I've heard lots of positive comments about the reconstruction. I think it will be really enhance our services and uh, we'll meet our needs not only for now but for the future. Uh, this building will be designed to accommodate newer and larger vehicles uh, and all our operations now and into the future. Great. Well, we would like to thank you very much for letting us put this program together in your old firehouse, yeah. and we look forward to seeing you in your new firehouse in the future. Well, it's very, my pleasure to be here today. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. And we'd thank like you. to give everyone a sneak peek at what that new facility looks like. If you take a look, the developer has a design on your screen. Check it out and we'll be back to see it in person in the future. Well, now that the weather is warm enough outside, there's a culture of youth that have found a hot spot right here in the city of Edina. It's at the YMCA Tri-City Skate Park, and it is really a true place to have a great time for all ages. And joining us to talk about it are Rob Coulard, the Community Program Director, and Ryan Lang, the Program Coordinator from the Y. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Well, tell us a little bit about this inline skating, freestyle biking, and skateboarding park. Um, it started back in 2003. It was a collaboration with uh, cities of Bloomington, Richfield, and Edina. Uh, they got together with the YMCA and to make a park for kids to uh, do skating and biking in. It's and been pretty exciting. And it's really a sport, and it has really grown, which is probably what created the demand for a place for these folks to, to practice their sport. Um, tell us about it, I mean, how it was built. I mean, for those of us that aren't really into, into that particular sport, how do you make it happen? Uh, basically, what it looks like is um, an empty pool. There's three of them connected to different poles, and the kids can drop in from anywhere from uh, four feet to 11 feet, and they'll drop right into like an empty pool, and they can come up on the other side, or they can skate around in the different pool areas. So it's pretty fun, pretty exciting. They can do it on their bikes or skates or on a skateboard. Wow, and, and that's some action on wheels and a pretty significant drop for a skill that they're practicing in the park. And you have a lot of activities to go around that to encourage them. But talk to me a little bit about how, how do people figure out when to start, when to stop? I mean, sure. Well, we can have uh, anywhere from 30 to even 70 people in the park at any given moment. So there is a concern of people crashing into each other. Uh, primarily, people will take turns. Uh, they have a little system of etiquette, uh, do about one or two minute runs and then watch each other and then the next person will go. And, and they say it's kind of a culture of movement in this particular sport because there is an etiquette and yeah. folks do take turns and they help each other out because they're practicing tricks on wheels, aren't they? Yes. 
So talk a little bit about uh, some of the programs. I mean, if, if I want to try it, just so I say I've done it, okay. uh, how do I get involved? Well, we have lessons. Um, we can uh, teach all ages and abilities, pretty much. One-on-one on one or group we lessons, too? We do one-on-one on one and group lessons, generally okay. six, uh, six students to one instructor. And you're asking um, individuals to wear helmets? Yes. What other protective gear is required? Or? Uh, everyone must wear a helmet. Uh, those under the age of 18 must wear knee pads and elbow pads. Okay. All right. And when is this park open? I mean, it obviously can't be year-round, but you increase the hours throughout the season. Yep. We're open spring through fall. Um, we'll start our summer hours in June. Mm -hmm. um, be open from about uh, afternoon to about sundown every day. And we should say that it's not just a place for youth, because you were telling me in preparing for this interview that you've got some folks my age that might be out there giving it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> we have had some, uh, some people around their 50s. Uh, we also get a lot of father and son teams who will come in together and skate or bike. And you bring groups in? We do bring groups and in. And how does that work? Uh, we, groups uh, approach us with interest in the skate park and usually have a fair number of skateboarders all ready to go. And then we just set up a closed, closed private time for them to come in or if they'd like to during our open hours. Great. Well, I really appreciate you coming to talk to us about it. It's located at York and 73rd, That's right correct. by the Y. And so if you want to hang out, try a new sport, yep. or practice your sport for inline skating, skateboarding, or freestyle biking, check it out. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. like fun. It's a lot of fun. Let's get on over now to one of Edina's most popular annual events, the Edina Art Fair. Joining us to talk about it today, Carol Britton. She is the president of the 50th in France Business and Professional Association. Thanks so much for joining us on In Edina. Thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. Tens of thousands of folks mm -hmm. come to the art fair mm -hmm. every year. 41st annual. So. What makes it different this year? Well, we have a lot of the same artists coming back, but we also have many new artists. And we do feature um, in the back area, we have areas for entertainment. With The layout is a little different, and it's much more welcoming. We've moved to kind of out more into the streets, so it's much more accommodating to the people and the merchants because business still goes on at 50th and France when the art fair is being conducted. We also have a shuttle service now from Southdale that will take transportation from the parking lot there to 50th and France free of charge. It, buses run about every 20 minutes and that we started that last year. It was incredibly popular. Well that makes it really easy it that does. you can just park in the mall Yep. and then hop on the shuttle about every 15 minutes yep. you said and, and then, then you know, come off. and go and it runs so regularly and it's free of charge and it not only serves for the, uh, the fair goers or the guests but also our merchants at 50th sometimes will even use it just to come and go from the area because it does get congested up there. We, it's a popular event. <laughs> well, it's one weekend. Uh -huh. It's June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Correct. And uh, you've got dozens of local and national artists coming. Talk about them. Well, we've got artists, you know, and there's every kind of art and there's every kind of price range. You know, if you want to spend a few dollars or if you want to spend thousands, of course, things that I always like are the things that are thousands. <laughs> it's the jewelry. Yeah, I've but seen there those are some too. beautiful yeah. artists. There's different mediums now, I think, too, when you go to these types of events. They're, they're upscale and they're interesting types of uses of products that they, you know, create from and interesting ways that they, you know, come about making them. Often the artists are even sitting there working on some of their next works in their booths as, as long as they're exhibiting. That's what I really like about these art fairs is the artists are there mm -hmm. in person working their craft yeah. and they'll actually take some time and talk to you a little bit sure. about how they got, where they got, what they got and how, how, how to go about it. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, it's a juried event mm -hmm. and since you have all the different kinds of um, drawing, pottery. Talk about just rattle off some of the different types. Well, there's a, lot of fiber, there's a lot of fiber artists now, people that do make things with different fibers from wearable art, to, you know, things you can wear, the different kinds of scarves, to a lot of fiber art and textured art in, you know, um, like collage type things. So those, I, I always love those things that have a, mediums that have a little bit of feel and texture to them. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, you know, like I said, there's a lot of beautiful jewelry designers and, and some of the, the craftsmanship that they put into the fine jewelry is just, it's beautiful. 
wonderful. And the use, you know, the use of interesting gemstones and different things that you may not see in your run-of-the-mill average, you know, jeweler or yeah. jewelry store is fun to see. And that's what makes it unique too, because mm -hmm. it's not and you, something you're going right. to see in a mall store, for Correct. instance. Yeah. It is unique, and it comes from different parts of. of and the country. many of the artists, you know, commission uh, individual pieces. If you see something that you like, you know, uh, there's a lot of tile artists. So if you're remodeling or doing a kitchen, you can actually specify things that you would want made for you. So it's a good connection for people that are even looking for um, to have someone really commission art for them. Now, in addition to the arts and crafts um, areas, you also have an area set aside for entertainment. Talk a little bit about that. We have an area in the back of the Dyna 5 Mall, which is going to be for, we call it our lifestyle stage. And what we feature there is the local merchants that have um, goods and services that they would like to show to the general public. It's a wonderful spot. It's kind of a respite. If, it, if you want to sit down and have a beverage and watch, we did, last year we had uh, fashion shows, we had cooking demonstrations. It was a very warm, windy day last year, and we didn't have kind of an area for gals to get ready. And it was, they were doing <laughs> bridal gowns, and I was, there was some kind of fiasco with a tent, as I recall, and some kind of the wind blowing, and there was women in kind of semi dress out there trying to pull up the thing. So this year, I think we're going to have that a little more well tuned. It was our first year last year. Sure. But it was a really popular event for a lot of people because I think once you walk around the area and if you're tired you want to just sit down or you just want to take a break it's a wonderful diversion also to be able to see what the merchants in the area because oftentimes people will come up for the art fair just to see the art fair and not be aware of different goods merchants and services that we have available well you have a business in the area mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that and and tell us a little bit about how that sort of fits in with uh, your work um, I have a cosmetic studio and uh, kind of the ir irony is it's the first weekend in June which is always a wedding day so many many a year I've had a bride rushing down the street with a veil flying behind to have her makeup done and a corn dog in her hand. <laughs> so so well, you see it all at the uh -huh, art fair and we do. hope folks have an opportunity to get there once again this year and we thank you very much thank for, for joining us me. on In the Dyna. Thanks. In a Dyna is a program about our community, our activities, and our residents, but we'd like to take a moment right now and highlight one of City of Edina's best. After 28 years, Pat Dawson is retiring as the city's receptionist. No doubt you've talked to her from time to time. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you so much. I bet you're excited. How much fun? I'm very excited. <laughs> I know you're looking forward to doing lots of new things, but tell us, if you could, a little bit about your career over the years. You started 28 years ago, and you had, what, six telephone lines back then? Or how did you manage it all? Six lines, and we had the old cord board that was a plug-in cord board. And we've seen that on some of these old shows, a little switchboard, mm -hmm. and you just plug one in, and, and you want to talk to so-and-so and plug them in. Is that That's really that's how it works? That's correct. That's correct. A full-time job? And, and Full-time, and from there we advance. We're on our third system since then. So i got to ask you a question about the switchboards. Yes. Can you hear people, what they were talking about back then? You could at, in those days. So you were yes. eavesdropping a little bit. Never, never. All the city secrets are right here over 28 years. So you manage a lot of phone lines for all these different departments. Talk about that. How challenging is that? It was very challenging because we had also the off-site facilities like the fire department, police, public works. So you took emergency um, calls too? No, no, okay. just, just the general calls. Okay. And um, it was challenging, but it was fun. I enjoy it now as much as I did 28 years ago when I started. And of course, technology changed your job yes. over time. Mm -hmm. So you went from the, the switchboard to, to high-tech systems. Right. How right. many phone lines now? We have about 20, incoming and outgoing. And the phones are ringing off the hook, or, or how is it working? Well, since there's direct dial numbers, I would say my volume is cut in half. But um, I'm doing cashier work also, which balances the difference the in the time. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a nice variety of work. keeps you very busy. Now, one of the things that's is so important is people tend to overlook receptionists, but they, I think, are probably the most important point of contact when you first walk in a building or when you first call an organization. Tell us what is the skill involved in that work? Well, I think it's very important to have people believe that they are the most important at the time and yeah. that um, you want to make sure they get in the direction that they should, what department it is, whether it's building or planning or um, police department. Pay your or bills. Or, you right. know, a lot of people don't even know what they want, actually. Right. Is that right? right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of sift through their conversation and point them down the right track. Correct. How do you handle the uh, not-so-happy callers? Well, you can put them on hold for a while. <laughs> 
You have a nickname. It's the voice of Edina. How did you get that? We had our first communications person was uh, his name was Ralph Campbell, and he named me that about three years after I started working there, and it's just stuck. It, it's been the name ever since, so, wow. and it's a nice name. The voice of Edina. When you look back over 28 years of your career, how would you give advice to somebody who maybe is just starting out in a city job as a receptionist? I guess I would just say be um, thorough with your job and um, listen to what people have to say. Well, you also get all kinds of folks. You have children calling, seniors calling, and people who know what they want calling, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to balance their personalities and needs simultaneously. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for 28 years. What are you going to do now with all this free time? Well, I'm planning on doing some volunteer work, and I'm sure I'll be doing some part-time work, and I will still stay involved with the Fall in the Arts Festival in September. Great. So we'll hear the voice of Edina around town, even though you're no longer going to be running a switchboard for Definitely. us. Definitely. All right. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank We'd you. like to take a moment and say congratulations to some other City of Edina retirees, including Administration Department Secretary Darlene Wallen, the Assistant City Sanitarian Elliot Marston, and Police Officer Chris Edom. Congratulations and best of luck. <laughs> Well, congratulations again to city retirees who are moving on to new adventures, and we'd also say congratulations to the class of 2007, seniors from Edina High School who are also moving on to new adventures. We'd like to welcome class president Ellen Cerf to Edina. Congratulations and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it, and I know that you are pretty excited. Definitely. <laughs> How many seniors are there this year graduating? There are about 550. Uh, people graduating. And the graduation is June 11th? Yep, at and, Northrop Auditorium. Okay, Northrop Auditorium. And everybody's going to be there and everybody's going to be official and they're moving on. Describe the class. Um, I would say we are definitely a special class. We're sort of an overachieving group. We like to be involved in sports and music and academics. Everyone sort of wants to do everything and be involved in everything. Great. And clearly there were a lot of achievements this year for the class of 2007. The entire Edina High School student body. Hockey. Yep. Basketball. Um, definitely. And what Tenth else consecutive uh, tennis, uh, tennis state, state championship. And academically? Uh, we had a bunch of national merit finalists, uh, which was pretty exciting, and strong debate and mock trial seasons. Wow, so. great. Well, you, had a, you had a great year and a great four years. Um, as you transition now into, into new endeavors, talk about graduation night and the big senior party, because that's sort of a ritual, too. <laughs> Um, well, after graduation, everyone gets on a bus and goes to the high school for the senior party, which is sort of one last time to be together. All um, 550 students yep. jump on buses. Yep, and um, the parents plan it all year, and it's a huge deal at the high school. They spend a couple days decorating, and then there are a lot of different activities during the night. There's a theme every year, but it's a secret, so I So won't. you don't know what the theme nope. is? <laughs> Great. And parents are involved in all of this? Yep, yep. Uh, a lot of parent chaperones, and um, there's a huge planning committee that the parents run. Wow, so. and how long and what do you do? Well, I know there are a lot of games. There are a lot of, um, there's an opportunity to work on a service project. I think this year we're sending um, supplies to troops and hospitals in Germany. Oh, wow. And um, there are performance groups that uh, come and then there are activities to do with your friends, sort of go around and looking at the decorations is even just really exciting. Great. And, and how long does it run? Is it an all night kind of a... Yep, it's all night. You are locked in the school until about five in the morning, I think. Wow. So. And you're up all night. Yep. Great. And you're doing good things and you're sticking together one last time. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your transition. Where are you headed? Um, next year I'll be at Stanford University in California. Great. Congratulations. And what's your Thank major you. going to be, do you know? Um, I think I'm going to major in economics. Great. Well, we'll be following your progress. Maybe we'll have you back sometime in the future. Again, congratulations to you and all of the seniors at Edina High School. We wish you the best. Thank you. Well, soon after the seniors graduate from high school, residents from the city of Edina will be lining up for a fabulous parade on July 4th. And joining us to talk about it is Maria Fessenmeyer, the chair of the Parade Planning Committee. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Lillian. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yes, and it's a festive event. Very much so. And more than 15,000 folks attend this event. Yes, yeah, so we're looking forward to a record-breaking 
year this year. Uh, we usually average anywhere from 12 to 15,000 people, but this year, just by the nature of the fact that Fourth of July is on a Wednesday, uh, and that we've ordered nice weather, uh, should be nice and sunny. Uh, we should have at least 15, we could have as high as 20,000 people. Well, July 4th is a special day and we're celebrating it. I know it's important to this community. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. The reason we put on our parade for the city of Edina, really there's three main reasons. Number one is to uh, celebrate our independence. Number two would be to honor those who got us here, especially our veterans. And number three, to really provide residents and spectators that join us for that day with a family entertaining event. Mm -hmm. And it starts at 10 o'clock. It starts at 10 o'clock sharp. It lasts for approximately an hour. And it's st the route starts approximately at City Hall, runs east on the road all the way down to Halifax. Okay. And you have a theme this year? We do. It is in honor of our fire departments and our police departments, and it's protecting and preserving Edina residents since 1888. Great. And the Grand Marshals? Our Grand Marshals, we're very proud this year that we have our police chief and our fire chief are going to be joining us as dual Grand Marshals wow. along with their families. Oh, that's great. They'll have yeah. a good time as well. And it is a lot of fun and it does sort of rejuvenate the community folks because you have so many different activities going on. But what's new this year? New this year, we're very excited. We're going to have two skydivers that are going to come in and do a drop with some smoke and some ribbons that are pretty much are going to come down right on the 50th and Wooddale area and land right at the intersection or at the baseball field right next to it. So the visitors should be able to see it everywhere, but the final spot will be at 50th and Wooddale. Wow, that's great. So yeah. folks can sort of line up there. Absolutely. And if you're in the parade, you're going to be staging at a different location, right? Absolutely. We stage all along the frontage road that runs to the west side of the Dyna Country Club, and then there's a private office building that we use their parking area for all the equestrian events so that they're not next to any jeeps or tanks or musical events and they don't get so spooked and they're away from the spectators for safety reasons. Um, other things that we have new this year is we have a lot more marching bands. We have some rifle drill squads that are wow. going to be helping us to start out the parade right after the uh, skydivers. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it takes a lot of people and people power to put this together. Can you talk a little bit about your committee? Sure, absolutely. We have a committee of approximately 12 folks. Uh, our committee uh, has about six core subcommittees, mm -hmm. and the day of the parade, we actually have a, enlisted about another 75 volunteers. Wow. Takes us a year well, to you're fundraise. Routing traffic, routing and traffic. organizing people. Safety is a very big uh, factor in our parade. We have to have a fun parade, but it has to be safe. It has to be safe for all our units those that are in our units and the spectators because that's an awful lot of people on one little mile of road. And you spend a year planning for the event and yes, you also do. spend the year fundraising for the we event. We do. We fundraise approximately $25,000 to put on the parade. A lot of people don't know that a lot of the entrance and the units that are in the parade we actually have to pay for. Sure. Um, this is a big money maker for a lot of the marching bands so this is their big time of the year for that and all the different equestrian events and whatnot. We also have a large group of neighborhood associations and civic organizations also. So everybody gets us. involved, this sort of embraces the entire celebration. Absolutely. We have folks that are out as early as 4.30 in the morning putting out their blankets and their chairs and their little picnic tables. So it sounds like you recommend you get out early, bring your chair early and get line Get a spot out. early. All right. That <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. We really look forward to it. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Year-long planning. We're wishing you sunshine. And it is a rain or shine event. It is a rain or shine event. In the event that someone thinks there's going to be inclement weather, call our hotline. Okay. And to get that hotline information, you can just check your screen now or go to the website. You can get more information about the parade activities at edinaparade.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed our program this month on Inidina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us this time. Best of luck to the high school seniors and city retirees. And special thanks to the fire department for letting us produce this program right here in Old Fire Station Number 1. We hope to do a new broadcast from their new facility coming soon. Until next time, have a great month. Mm -hmm.